Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 711. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm David Pelegi from Christ Church in Jerusalem. All right, I want to thank you guys for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted, where we sit down and talk about the Anglican world, the Christian world, and sadly, sometimes we have to mention the secular world. And I have with me today David Poligli, who's the uh, rector of Christ Church in Jerusalem, and uh, a contributor to this program in the past. And whenever there's a topic we need to talk about dealing with Israel or dealing with Jerusalem or the politics of the Middle East, I, I like to have David on to help add perspective, because... Here in America, we're kind of tainted with what our perspective really is because we're not on the ground seeing what's happening uh, in the Middle East and Israel. And the dynamic of that part of the world changes a lot in micro and macro uh, increments. And we don't always pay attention to what's happening. And we get caught up here, especially in COVID times, with uh, watching the world here in America and not paying attention to what's happening over in Israel and we really need to pay attention to the Middle East and Israel because we have to have the, a love for Israel and a love for the Middle East and a love for our friends and enemies and we need to be sure that in the end we don't let history repeat itself and I have David on here to help us to stop history from repeating ourselves. But first of all, David, welcome to the program. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I do enjoy showing up uh, on Anglican TV once every several years. And uh, it's, uh, it's actually a great honor. It's a great honor for me. All right. Uh, we're going to be sitting down and talking about the Middle East and Israel and politics in Palestine, because this was brought up by a press release article uh, from Archbishop Justin Welby, which said, in essence, listen, the the population of Christian Palestinians, Palestinians and uh, Christians is being wiped out. It went from 60,000 to 2,000. Uh, and the only way we could explain that is it's got to be the Jews. And I think... Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm yes. kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm not being exact with the words here, but that's that's you're, how people read it. Paraphrasing. I'm paraphrasing. Well, you're, yes, uh, and certainly some people will read it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the statement, uh, uh, Welby's statement, uh, as well as the uh, the statement issued by the heads of the local churches here, it, it was actually quite careful and nuanced. But uh, unfortunately, uh, Kevin, when it comes to the Middle East, I think a lot of people, uh, you might say, they lose their heads. Uh, people become quite emotional. Um, they take one side or the other. And uh, in the process, uh, nuance and complexities uh, get erased. And I often tell my friends, look, if you want to know something about the Middle East or you're really interested in Jerusalem, then skip the sound bites uh, and take some time and try to understand uh, the issue uh, and its complexities. If you don't have time for it, then don't make a judgment. Let it pass in one ear uh, and out the other ear. And, uh, you know, that's the situation uh, with, with the churches here. Uh, the churches here uh, in Jerusalem, uh, you know, they have a, it's, uh, they have a very complicated uh, relationship uh, with the Muslims. They have a very complicated relationship uh, with the, the state of Israel. And uh, if you want to talk about some of the, you might say, the ups and downs of uh, the Christian community here or Christian communities, um, there are positives, you know, uh, in their relationship with the state of Israel. Uh, and there's also some uh, some issues that are negative, and they they need uh, they they need correcting. But at the same time, uh, especially for outsiders and those who have some sympathy or love for for, for uh, Christian churches in our area, Jerusalem in particular, 
some of the problems, a number of the problems, uh, are self Yes, they're not uh, problems to do uh, with the Jewish people. They're not problems to that uh, uh, vis-a-vis the municipality of Jerusalem or even Jewish extremist groups, uh, so-called, uh, which um, have made life uh, difficult sometimes for, for Christians. Uh, they're internal problems. And the church, churches here, uh, first and foremost, need to look internally and put their houses in order. Um, and, and that really begins with, uh, you might say, uh, the need for uh, a spiritual revival and a need for a certain vision and commitment uh, to maintain community, uh, Christian community uh, in this part of the world. Because especially in Jerusalem uh, and other parts of the country, you have Christians who are well-educated, who can speak uh, foreign languages, who um, have uh, easy access to foreign passports, and uh, they immigrate. Uh, they immigrate not simply because there's pressure from Jews or Muslims. They immigrate because basically the Christian population here is very bourgeois and they want a nice life uh, and they want a good profession and uh, they can find it in France or Canada uh, or, or the United States. And uh, it, by the way, it's not just, not just an, an Israeli, uh, sorry, not just a Christian or a Palestinian Christian problem. It's a problem that we have uh, with Israeli Jews as well. Uh, many people in Israel are trained to be doctors, lawyers, you know, high-tech engineers, and you can't find jobs here. I mean, how many doctors or how many lawyers, you know, uh, can a population of 10 million people support? So you don't find enough work. You, you know, head toward the head toward the United States. So, as I said, the problems uh, the, the problems are indeed uh, are indeed complicated. Well, you described and again, if you, it's not a you described a lackluster church yeah. as being part of the problem. I, I, I there there's a, the church the churches the traditional churches here mm-hmm. they have many strengths and I want to say this with all love and empathy, mm-hmm. but they also have a number of weaknesses. And uh, they're, one of their strengths and something that uh, we need to appreciate and even celebrate is that after, I don't know, 1,300 years to, uh, of Islamic pressure, you, we still have uh, Christian communities here, people who, uh, despite uh, the diff- their, their difficulties and being second-class citizens in an Islamic, uh, Islamic society, have maintain uh, their faith and, and maintain a commitment a commitment to Jesus at the same time uh, all of virtually all of these Christian communities are closed communities this comes from basically from Islamic pressure and uh, what this means is you can in, in a general in a in an Islamic society an Islamic environment you can you can practice your religion uh, you can pray as you want. You can celebrate as you want. You'll be born in a certain community. You can be raised in that community. You can die in that community. But don't try to proselytize or don't try to evangelize or don't try to take in new people. Don't try to be open, especially uh, vis-a-vis, you know, vis-a-vis the, Mo- the Muslim community. Uh, that is forbidden. And uh, we... we We'll make sure that uh, that doesn't happen. And so at at the root of the problem is that um, there's no growth in uh, in these Christian communities. Uh, There's a certain, uh, you might say, stagnation. And if um, the communities here in the Middle East can't find a way to uh, open up and to receive new members, then Christianity will indeed uh, die in most parts of the Middle East. It may not die in Israel and or Palestine because the Christian population here is actually uh, increasing, but uh, it will die throughout the Middle East. Let's put it another way, Kevin. If in a generation, if a generation, 
in a generation from now, we don't have some priests, uh, deacons, pastors, evangelists, you know, who go by the name of Walid or Muhammad or, or uh, Fatma. Um, if, these, we, if these are not leading the Christian community, uh, there will be no more Christian community, right? You, you, you have to take in, uh, you have to uh, be willing to, to take the risk of opening yourself up to Muslims, Druze, Circassians, you know, um, Sufis, uh, uh, Alawites, Jews, whatever, those who want to, who, to, to join the church, that you've got to be able to say, yes, come and join us. We will disciple you. And uh, yes, we're willing to pay the price or pay or take the risk of, of doing such a thing. Uh, that is the heart of the that is the heart of the heart of the problem here. There are pro other problems, you know, problems to do with land or prob or, or property, um, uh, so on and so forth. But uh, the, the church somehow the churches they have to get out of the ghetto, and for many many. Uh, Christian communities, and I've heard uh, Jewish Israelis also say this about the state of Israel. It's not not my criticism necessarily; it's their criticism. But for 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 many minority groups in the Middle East, the goal can't be simply to survive. Okay, especially uh, if we're thinking about it in, in in gospel terms. Yes, the goal is to you know to 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 go and make disciples of Jesus. Uh, the goal is to, of course, uh, glorify God or sanctify, you know, God's name by by the way uh, by the way we live, um, you know, and so on and so forth. And so, for many uh, groups, and again, just let's say it with total empathy, not throwing stones. We shouldn't throw stones at anyone, uh, but but for many many Christian communities, the goal is simply survival. And uh, if you have low birth rates, because Christians do have low birth rates, and you can't blame that on the Muslims, and you can't blame that on the state of Israel, you know, where the you know, Muslim families have maybe five, six kids, uh, Jewish, e e even secular Jewish families, you know, have three or four children, religious Jewish families have seven or eight children, uh, and, and Christians being, um, again, usually upper middle class uh, professionals, well-educated, will have two, or they might have three. Um, so you, again, that's not, you can't blame that on the, the Jewish people. That's again, that's an internal, that's an internal, uh, you know, Christian issue. Or if you have two children and, uh, you know, your kids decide to pack up and go to Canada, um, you know, Who's going to be left here? And I'll tell you that here at Christ Church, we have we, we have a, Bible studies and social events for all kinds of uh, uh, Palestinian uh, women, Christian women uh, here in the uh, the Christian quarter, um, the Armenian quarter, and uh, it's really sad, Kevin. All their son, many of their sons uh, and daughters are all living abroad. Yes, uh, and uh, you know they're lonely, and uh, they're, you know, don't don't necessarily have a uh, have a uh, uh, feel very perhaps satisfied uh, or very joyful because you know they're so far away from they're so far away from their family. So if we want to blame somebody or something, you know, let's be honest about it. Although. Uh, and let's do so in the most uh, uh, sympathetic or, or even empath uh, empathetic way. But let's not let's not lie or 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 um, become or or uh, take the cheap way out and say, oh, it's the fault of the Muslims. There is Islamic pressure uh, in in many different parts. That's not, oh, it's not the fault of the state of Israel. Uh, you know, there's. There are all these factors, but there's a lot of internal Christian issues, as, uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, issues within the Christian community that uh, I think need addressing. 
anti-Semitism has changed over time as far as <coughs> mm -hmm. um, how we define it. And I mm -hmm. thought we could talk a little bit about that as long as I have you on the program because I keep seeing it and I want to be sure that we identify it even in its new form. And if you could address mm -hmm. what anti-Semitism used to be and then it, how it looks today, uh, that would really help the program. Well, you know, the, even the term anti-Semitism is, um, uh, is uh, very problematic uh, in, in, in and of itself because in, it, uh, it can mean virtually anything. And uh, it can be uh, very difficult uh, to define I think at last count, there are 40,000 books have written have been written about the subject. But uh, there's one thing for sure. You, you might call it, it the oldest hatred. Um, and it's a hatred that um, it, it, it is, I guess, like a chameleon. Uh, it can adopt, you know, to uh, it, it adopts itself in it to any country, uh, virtually any culture. Uh, any, uh, you know, political ideology. So you can have left-wing anti-Semites, you can have uh, right-wing anti-Semites, you can have uh, uh, the socialist and the Marxist, and then you can have, uh, uh, you know, people who are, who are capitalist. You can have anti-Semitism in the Ukraine and uh, anti-Semitism uh, in South Africa. And uh, this is something that uh, has been going on since the days of the uh, the Book of Esther, uh, down uh, down to our time. And I wouldn't want to minimize all of the. I mean, it's a very complicated, uh, very complicated subject. But I think if I'm speaking to largely to committed Christians here on uh, Anglican TV. Uh, there, there's one approach, and it's not the only approach, but there's one approach that we need to consider carefully. Yes, at the root of anti-Semitism, and by anti-Semitism, I don't mean that we agree with the state of Israel or we don't find some of the, uh, we have no critique, perhaps, of, uh, of, a, of a Jewish community or, you know, the Jewish state here, okay? I'm not talking about some kind of hundreds of percent support for Israel. But at, at its very heart, uh, anti-Semitism is demonic. Anti there's, a, there's a demonic, uh, unexplainable, yes, and surely spiritual uh, force of darkness uh, behind all of this. And I think that um, Paul says it really well in uh, you know, Romans 11, that uh, God loves the Jewish people, uh, you know, for the sake of the patriarchs. And I think it's pretty easy to reason from that, that what God loves, Satan hates. And uh, I uh, think I've quoted uh, Marcel Dubois, who used to be a, uh, he was, he, he died recently, he was a, uh, French monk, Catholic monk. Um, I forgot the, uh, the, the his order escapes me at the moment, but uh, he was the head of the philosophy department at Hebrew University. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, a believer. And he used to say to his Israeli friends, he said, you have, you better be careful because Satan is after you. He either wants to destroy you physically or compromise you morally. Yes, because I do think that somehow the salvation of the world uh, and the well-being of the church there um, is somehow connected in a mysterious way uh, with the Jewish people. Uh, we are, uh, there's an inter interdependence and a mutuality, which I think you see uh, in the book of Rome, uh, Romans chapter 11, it's, it's hinted at. And, uh, you know, the, the Jewish people um, certainly have not uh, been replaced in any way, shape, or form uh, by the church. And just as Satan would like to frustrate and destroy the church, I think he'd like to do so uh, 
uh, right to destroy the Jewish people, or at least destroy their 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 witness uh, in the world. Today. Well, I think there, there's truth to that because if you look at the image of Israel in the world eyes and in the eyes of the UN, uh, the human uh, rights campaign part of the UN deems Israel as the enemy, uh, yeah. and thinks that uh, Saudi Arabia, thinks Turkey, thinks um, Iran, Iraq, and other Middle East countries are wonderful. Yeah, that's see, that's the new anti-Semitism. It, it, in the Middle Ages, uh, the um, the common perception, misperception, of course, uh, amongst uh, uh, Christian in Christian Europe and other places, the the the, uh, the common perception it's the Jew. The Jew is causing the trouble. The Jew is poisoning the well. The Jew is uh causing us to be sick you know um so on and so forth and uh, as europe became more and more uh secular um you know it, it wasn't simply that uh, god wasn't in control or there there wasn't a battle between good and evil right so all this you might say angst about the jewish people in secular Europe uh, started to morph into this uh, idea, oh, the Jews are now running the world. <clears throat> and now there's and now there's a conspiracy. Uh, and so you had things like the protocols of the, the elders of Zion, or you can go on the internet and, and find uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of websites, which, you know, blame the Jews for this war, you know, the, the, the shortage of toilet paper in the United States, you know, the crop failure in the Ukraine, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, now it's even moved a little further along that uh, all of the, most of the problems in the world today, uh, certainly in this part of the world, they're all to do with the state of Israel. It's no longer individual Jews, it's not necessarily the Jewish conspiracy, but it's the state of Israel, you know, with all its powerful supporters, you know, all over the world. Uh, and therefore, instead of being the individual Jew that poisons the well, it's the state of Israel that's, you know, poisoning, you know, uh, uh, labor relations, you know, throughout the world or, or uh, you know, uh, fermenting uh, war and conflict and uh, and so on and so forth. So it, 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 that anti-Semitism anti is still there. It's just, you might say, it's uh, changed its colors a little bit. Well, what so of, that's the new anti-Semitism. That's the new anti-Semitism in which we face. One of the things we see reported here in the West about Israel is that it's the new apartheid. The, the way uh -huh. that Israel treats the Palestinians is uh, as second-class citizens, as mm -hmm. um, they're being denied all their rights. And I think, you know, let, let's include the Palestinian um, situation in this interview as much as possible without uh -huh. diving so deep that we go four hours. <laughs> but, okay. Um, all right. So let, yeah. uh, let, let me look. Let me say this, that to say that there is no racism in Israel uh, would be, you know, would be a lie or to even to underplay uh, the fact that there is racism. But but not all racism is apartheid. Right. OK, not all racism is apartheid. And so you have um, a, a lot of groups who throw this who, who throw this word around. And we do have quite an imperfect democracy here, but within the state of Israel, which includes at least 2 million Palestinian citizens, most of whom are Muslims, within the state <coughs> of Israel, uh, you certainly, you have uh, a free press, you have uh, free and democratic elections, you have the rule of law, albeit perfectly and perfectly, I might say, uh, but still better than any other country in the Middle East. Uh, we have uh, voting, full voting rights uh, for uh, 
the, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And we even have an Islamic Arab party that now sits uh, in the ruling coalition. Uh, I can't say that's apartheid. Uh, I would also say that part of what part of what you uh, what is what is racism here or prejudice or uh, ignorance you know one side you know uh, being uh, ignorant or racist uh, about the other side and by the way racism cuts both ways you know, racism within the Palestinian community uh, against um, uh, against Jews. I would say that uh, you I think we had better keep in mind that a good part of this is based on a conflict in which both sides, you know, have lost uh, uh, you know, a, a fair number of people. Yeah, people have died in terrorism. People have died in war. People uh, have died, uh, you know, fleeing as refugees. And uh, so that context right, needs to be considered. It's not South Africa. Or it's not the American South uh, today, or it's not uh, you know you know the, mini, the city of Minneapolis. Uh, you know, there's been a real war. There's been a war in which you know uh, both sides have uh, seen fit. Uh, both sides have understood that they need to defend themselves or protect themselves, and both sides have committed excesses. Yes. Um, and uh, surely, you're, uh, in a situation like this, you're going to have, uh, you know, you're, go you're going to have uh, racism, oppression, and so on and so forth. So, now, that's the state of Israel. The state of Israel also has, you know, a lot of control, not total, over the West Bank. And uh, this is where the situation gets, you know, certainly gets a, gets a little... Uh, uh, a little stickier, uh, you know, the c controlling movement of Palestinians, allowing Palestinians uh, into Israel, uh, and Israel has <clears throat> some control over which Palestinians come in and which uh, and and who doesn't. And uh, I think on on this score, I have some someone who lives in Jerusalem. I have some criticism criticisms also. Uh, uh, of this state, uh, you know, the state of Israel and uh, certain, you know, Israeli policies. But to brand the whole enterprise as apartheid uh, <clears throat> is very simplistic. And it, by the way, it's, it's, it's propaganda. And where did this propaganda originate from? It originated from the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc. They're the ones who, you know, let this genie out of the bottle. And... Uh, you know, this is uh, something that, uh, you know, you know, came from communist, really Marxist propaganda. And uh, unfortunately for Israel, it's never been able to to perhaps explain itself. And again, Kevin, the problem is part of the problem is <clears throat> if you don't want to take time to listen uh, and you don't want to take time to understand and you want to you want a simple slogan, uh, then okay, you know, Israel is apartheid, and, and don't confuse me with, you know, don't confuse me, you know, with the facts. You know. uh, so th that's certainly part of, I think, part of an issue here. I think what, you know, you'd say, well, what should we do about it? What should Anglicans do about it? I think there, think there, there there's something spiritual at stake here. Yes, the... Um, Israel, the Jewish people, yes, whether they're secular or observant, whether they're right wing or left wing, you know, they, like the church, they carry God's name. Yes. And uh, whether they like it or not, just as the church, just the same would be for the church, whether we like it or not, <clears throat> we also, we, we, we also carry God's name. And uh, I think when the Bible says pray for the peace of Jerusalem or, or we should pray for the Jewish people, we should do so because most of the world, unbelieving world, and, and some, of those in the belief, uh, the, some of those are Christians or other religions, believe that the state of Israel or the, the Jewish people have something to do with God. Yes. And therefore, 
you know, is God being glorified in this place? Or the name of God being, you might say, sanctified? Or is God's name being desecrated? Now, some people listening to this will say, of course not. <clears throat> Those Jews don't believe and uh, they, you know, they have forfeited the rights, you know, uh, they have forfeited the covenant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where are the, you know, the new Israel? Where the, where the, where the true Israel? But, you know, we don't, we don't get to choose those things. You know, for, the, for all of my friends who, you know, think Catholicism, is, you know, is a false religion, et cetera, et cetera, that's irrelevant. Most of the world looks upon the Catholic Church as being Christian. And whether we agree with them or not, or not we should be praying for the, the Roman Catholic Church that they do the right thing, say the right thing, and lift up Jesus in the right way. And we should pray the same, you know, for the state of Israel, that they, uh, you know, would sanctify God's name and walk in the light, you know, walk in the light that, you know, that they have. And if we have a critique or a criticism, I think it just, it needs to be said, and it can be said to Jewish people, it can be said in love, and it can be said in humility, yes? Uh, keeping in mind that the sins of the church throughout the ages, yes, have been far greater, you know, uh, than the sins of the Jewish people are far greater than this, you know, the sins of, uh, the, the, the sins of the state of Israel. I, I don't want to, get too messy but you know when we went to war in iraq a hundred thousand civilians were killed mm. basically yeah you now people can argue it was worth it wasn't worth it yes and uh you know there was some protest etc cetera, etc cetera. when israel gets involved and tangled in a war in gaza you know the streets of every european city you know start to burn you know um or when China kills Muslims, you know, in its uh, in its Western provinces, uh, you don't see you don't see no one says you know or gives a hoot. Yeah, or, no, he says boo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. But boy, let there let there be a few hundred people killed in a, a war between Gaza and Israel, and uh, you know, everyone, many people, you know, now go go ballistic. So, um, you know, I think this is, uh, again, if you have a certain, if, I think if Israelis and Jews know that you care for them and you love them, uh, you, they don't have to agree with them that it's easier to speak into, uh, uh, to speak into a situation from that point of view than it is to take, you know, the, uh, you know, the radical, you know, sort of anti-Zionist approach because Israelis don't listen to that. Um, they they just they just tune that out. And so uh, Israel needs you know loving friends, critical friends. We need to love the Jewish people like God loves the Jewish people. Doesn't mean we always uh, agree with them, but it's like the church. We love the church. You know, this it's you know it's many problems and it's you know it's many. It's many, many failures. So um, that did probably answer your question too much about whether Christianity is increasing or, or decreasing in the Holy Land. But basically, in the state of Israel, it is uh, Christians, the small Christian population does increase, you know, a bit. It doesn't decrease. Uh, Christians are uh, well paid, generally well paid. They're in uh, very... They, most of them have very, very good jobs uh, in Israel, end up being doctors or, again, they work for Apple or Intel or uh, they, have, uh, they have their own businesses. Uh, many are in the tourist business. Uh, and so they're basically doing well here. Uh, we, and some of the issues highlighted by the local churches really only concern Jerusalem and sometimes... Uh, an occasional issue in, in Jaffa, but uh, it's not something that you, you uh, see all throughout the country. Well, you know, one of the things, you know, I want to be sure that we get across here is that the Middle East is hard ground I I as far as growing the Christian church. 
you know, mm-hmm. it, it, there's, it's not like uh, other places in the world. It's it's like the Northeast here in America. There's just you know, it, it, it's very difficult to uh, proselytize, evangelize in that type of environment. Uh, uh, not opposing Judaism, not opposing Islam, but trying to get the message of uh, uh, the kingdom into those realms is very difficult. Uh, how, how is there a, a good way to reach um, the, the Jews and the uh, Muslims with the message of Jesus? Um, yeah, in our experience, we don't, because um, proselytizing in Israel is, it's thought of as something on the level of uh, child abuse or something, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, so usually standing out on the street and, and handing out tracks or doing that kind of thing, uh, is not, uh, very, um, uh, not very welcomed, you might say, or not, uh, not very, something that's not very popular. Uh, and, and our, um, case, the case of Christchurch is that, um, our, our, our position is, our, our our practice, you might be, is just to be a Christian community, to be a, a Christian community or a believing community of uh, Palestinians, of uh, Palestinians who are former Muslims, of uh, some Messianic Jews, uh, some folks who, who come from different countries around the world. Uh, and those who are interested will ask, <laughs> they'll come and ask. Uh, they'll either see the good works of the community or hopefully see something of the transforming power of of uh, of the lord and lots of israelis ask uh, lots of israelis are curious jewish people are curious uh and uh that's you know i i think that that's the the best approach uh, and if people aren't asking we uh we um uh, as a community, there's there's a lot to do. There's working with the poor. Uh, there is, uh, of course, you know, <clears throat> the, the discipling of uh, uh, of the community and, and new believers and uh, education of children and 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 so on. Uh, so we seek just to be you know, really something of an indigenous uh, presence. And it's very interesting when Israelis come and talk to us, Kevin. Uh, they usually ask a very Jewish question. Uh, Christians, for example, always are, they always want to s- tell people what we believe. Are we, this, and they also tell, you know, what kind of, uh, what is our theology and what kind of Anglican, you know, might we be? Israelis aren't so interested in it. They, what they want to know is, what do you do? Yes. What do Christians do? What do, well, what do Messianic Jews do? Or what would a Muslim who now becomes a follower of Jesus do? How do you pray? <clears throat> How do you live? What holidays, you know, uh, you know, what holidays do you keep? You know, uh, what is your, what, what, what is your system of ethics or, <clears throat> or, or morality? This is like of critical, uh, critical uh, importance. And perhaps you may, um, have noticed, you know, that um, in the Bible itself, you know, even the New Testament especially, you know, it's not always a question of what is faith, right? But uh, the Bible kind of answers a very sort of Jewish question, what does faith do? Yeah. Well, right? Yeah. Not, yeah. As, not what is love, what is love? Because uh, There's a million pop songs, what is love? Uh, you know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, very Jewish. This is what love does, you know. The epistle, the the uh, the, the epistle of First John doesn't tell us not only tells us what the truth is, it tells us what the truth does. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, so that's one hand, uh, and that's very nice. But you know, the 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 place where the the uh, Christian world uh, is not uh, paying enough attention is that in the Muslim world you um, have an unprecedented number of Muslims coming to faith. 
uh, in different parts of the Muslim world, uh, in places like Algeria, in Kurdistan, in Iran, um, <clears throat> a few other, uh, in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. for example, uh, never in the in the 1300 years of Islamic uh, history, yes, have have there been so many apostates, as the Muslims would call them, or so so many people have abandoned uh, the, the Islamic faith. And um, the interesting thing is, is that um, God, you know, God obviously <clears throat> sent uh, an evangelist. And that evangelist, uh, who appeared about 1989, uh, has had more success uh, in bringing people uh, to the Lord in the Muslim world than, than you know, that, again, than any uh, any other person in history. And it's it's kind of uh, interesting because you know there've been Christian missions to the Muslims, Christian schools. Um, work amongst Protestant work amongst Muslims for 200 years, Roman Catholic work amongst Muslims uh, before that. And again, success has been quite minimal. But in the last 30 years, it's been in a huge explosion, thanks to this particular God sent evangelist. And perhaps you might want to guess who this guy, who this guy is, or who he was, because he's no longer with us, actually. Please share. No, well, <clears throat> the Ayatollah Khomeini. Yes, <laughs> I was going to say the yeah, Ayatollah Khomeini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, when I, I think when people saw the fruit of the uh, Islamic Revolution in Iran, and then later the Islamic revival uh, that uh, swept uh, through the Muslim world here. Uh, uh, the Arab Muslim world, the non-Arab Muslim world, there are a lot of people thought, wait a minute, this is not the kind of religion I want. And it caused them to, to, to look around. But it took someone like the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, and ISIS, uh, you, you know, to, to cause this radical, radical reassessment. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, this was... Uh, uh, it, it, this again, this is something totally, <clears throat> totally unprecedented. And if we, and, and, and as Christians or the Christian world, we miss this opportunity, we don't kind of jump through the window or take advantage uh, of this through prayer and supporting those uh, who are on the ground. Uh, and by the way, not only praying and supporting, I think one of the, the most important things we can do uh, as a Christian community in the United States is to make sure that we are 100% behind uh, religious freedom in, in every, you know, every country in the world. I know it's not a big priority uh, with the current administration, but we should uh, tell them that for us uh, as a community, especially as an evangelical community, um, th this, this is one of the most important uh, this is one of the, the issues that really, you know, burn inside of us. You know, we want everyone to have an opportunity, you know, to to hear the gospel and to practice their faith. Yes, and the only way we can do that is on a level playing field, and uh, that, that uh, all the governments, especially in the Middle East, you know, uh, allow, you know, for you know, freedom of religion. Maybe it won't exactly be like the luxury we have in the United States. Uh, but still, you know, the Muslim comes to faith in Saudi Arabia, you know, we we sure we surely want to expect that that person won't be, you know, executed for their faith or that, um, you know, churches of some one kind or another won't be allowed to operate. Yeah, I mean, it's, so, it, it, there is quite a dichotomy or opposing force to look at the Western freedoms here we we experience with freedom of religion versus China, North Korea, the Middle East, and other places. Um, it's so taken for granted um, the kind of the the rights we have here. 
where they don't exist. Well, it's not, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not only taken for granted, but of course it's under attack, is yeah. it not? Um, and of course, we don't. Uh, you and George can discuss that. Yeah, at, that's a, at, yeah. At a, that's a Western thing. Time. Yeah. It's yeah, crazy. It's a All right. Well, you've given us 45 minutes of your valuable time, and I want to uh, thank you uh, so much for that. You guys are entering. Uh, well, no, I get, based on your time, you're already into the Shabbat, right? Listen, um, I hope you don't mind, yeah. but I'm charging you by the word. Oh, no. I, I have on my phone here. I have here on my phone uh, an app that tells uh, me how much I I, uh, I, I I can bill you for. <laughs> Uh, I want you to know that uh, I don't charge for uh, definite articles and prepositions, okay. uh, but nouns and verbs, okay, <clears throat> and adjectives, you know, will will cost you. So um, don't that. be shocked when you get the book. I would right. not be shocked. And what a great opportunity hey. for people who support Anglican TV to donate to Anglican TV. Hey, absolutely, so they can pay your bill. And I want to assure you, all, everything you send, Kevin, will be used for the Lord's work. Oh, my my favorite visits uh, to Israel are to to go to your church, attend worship there. You have a wonderful guest house. Um, you yeah. you are uh, one of the, the very highlights of the old city. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. We're about to reopen soon, so if folks want to come over. Uh, sorry, you have to be vaccinated to to enter Israel at oh. the moment. But if you've been vaccinated three, four, five, or six times. Mm -hmm. We'd love to see you. <laughs> I'll put a link to uh, CMJ and to uh, Christ Church in the show notes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to, to visit with you again. I'm Kevin Carlson. This has been an interview with David Politely for Anglican Unscripted 711.